So I'm all about, this is long, but the thing is all about wanting to help people have a voice. And it's not the voice that's currently playing on television, although that's, it, actually, it actually has the same spirit for people who don't have access to it. Do you know the voice? Oh, it's, it's where, I mean, where people who are promising in, singing, in music get to audition for the great, you know, it's a really hot, hot job, but it, it is the same thing. It's giving people who haven't had voices. So I don't want, I mean, I, I started writing and I wrote a whole bunch of things that I want to go through, but I also want to at various times hear from you. Okay. So I'll start on this, um, which is all about getting involved in the, in the whole business, falling into the whole business 25 years ago because I had a problem with authority. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, you thank you for guiding me out here. It's really nice. Um, I've been in, you know, I've been in the business city. has really been the pillar in terms of, in 1980, he really um, understood that the medium itself was you know, not about the content, but about the medium. <coughs> that um, all media was persuasive and personal and political and economic and aesthetic and psychological moral and ethical, and it leaves none of us uh, unaffected. So it's probably one of the most powerful instruments on the planet. He died in 1980, but what he thought about was, has become commonplace. It took the internet to make him whole, and that took whole 10 years after his death. I was lucky. I played a small role in some very important steps. Uh, the evolution of what I call the transformation of the top down uh, to the bottom up. Broadcasters started as a top down experience. The broadcasters would send you their version of the world, which you could digest it, ready for your unconscious acceptance. It was the kind of power from those who held it to the people who didn't. And it went from an automatic assumption that the people needed feeding, and that only these, those appointed by the government, could carry out that responsibility. And I was one of those people, and I loved it. Uh, and I thought it was revolutionary at the time. But the need to control, but it's gone from sort of the need to control to an explosion of the opinion to the point now where everyone has to figure it out for themselves. Media today is a tool. It's a tool for you. It it's a shape for you, and it's tested by you. It's incorporated by you to get your needs. It's something that is constantly changing, chewing up more territory, getting to more remote villages, and giving more and more people the power to express. But it wasn't always so. If what I say means anything, I hope it makes us all regard the media revolution as a gift given to us, giving us more and more freedom, more democracy, and the best use of our minds. We've taken to it like a duck to water. We think it has always been there, but it wasn't. My point for this discussion is that now is the most exciting time in media, the changing of the guard. The broadcasters are scared. They're trying to hold their positions. The horses have left the farm. You and the people hold control in your hand. 
we shouldn't ever be scared. My thesis is that these technologies, the technological leaps that I have seen have resulted in bringing color to the people in a way that we never dreamed of it. And it happened without anyone really knowing that it was coming. It was only in looking back in the rearview mirror that you can see the change, the evolution. So today I'm going to go back there to show you how I was in the midst of it and what is today and how the sort of today's revolution crept upon me and I'm enveloped in that. To go right back to the beginning of the dinosaurs, <laughs> in the beginning there was the all-knowing box in the corner of the living room. You gathered in front of it, you watched it, your parents gathered in front of it, you still gather in front of it for hockey night in Canada. But uh, that was really kind of something we're called the evolution from the fire in the cave. It was the fire, it was the box. The journalists were out roaming the world, bringing back information and organizing it into bite sized pieces. The network executives were deciding on who would be on the airwaves, and the people were being bombarded with news, information, commercials, anything. A lot of the Hollywood material or the news bulletin that scared them to death. Right, right away, I don't know, I think when I was 10, I was interested in when I could get hold of this for myself. I felt it belonged to, to all of us and not to the network executives. But first I had to get to be one of them in order to see how they did it. I was a fan. And I don't know if you know the show called This Hour Has Seven Days. Does anyone know the show? I've seen clips. You've seen clips. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. The man who starred at This Hour just died uh, just before Christmas. Died. I mean, he was the last of the group that um, delivered This Hour Has Seven Days. And it was 1964. And every Sunday, um, I would tune in at 10 p.m. And the broadcaster was 10 o'clock. And what, what they were doing was showing things that had never been seen. For instance, they had the Ku Klux Klan on their show live with paper bags over their head. And they had uh, an African American sitting with them. And the idea was that they would talk to each other and have a frank discussion of why the Ku Klux Klan was doing what they were doing and how the African Americans needed to have them change their behavior. And the CBC was just, you know, running this. And every morning, on Monday morning, people in the offices would all gather around who were talking about the show that they saw last night, because that was just one of the absolutely outrageous shows that they, done, that they did. It was outrageous. And people were so, uh, People were so freaked out that they weren't even almost talking about it. Except that 3.3 million people tuned into the show at a time in Canada when population isn't what it was today. It was extraordinarily huge. And then they did a show on the government being critical of them, and the government decided they had to vote. <laughs> and uh, so they convinced the CBC since. CBC is the government agency to take them off the air, which they did. And uh, the people marched, thousands and thousands of people marched to Ottawa from Halifax from Vancouver, demanding to have this show put back on. They never did, and they never, you know, it, it was gone forever. It actually, um, 60 Minutes came to Patrick Watson and Doug Ryan and these sort of um, they were my heroes in the broadcasting business, and they got, they all started 60 minutes to get, you know, not really um, getting at the, at the truth of things. Um, I was shocked, uh, but the door had been opened for me with that. And um, I found myself uh, working on a documentary with uh, Bobby Seale. And, Jerry Rubin and Emmy Hoffman. Now I was actually in the 60s myself with this documentary. It was being made by a very um, 
wonderful documentarian, Morgan Lansing, who was a forerunner of the new social media because he was giving a voice to Jerry Rubin and the Chicago's. From there, Moses Snyder, who had just started City TV, heard about this crazy woman and hired me. And I, we had not gone on the air yet. And the idea about Saint TV is that everything that convention television did, we were not going to do. Now, the secret about that was that we didn't have any money. <laughs> so we couldn't do what they were doing anyway. But instead, we made the audiences our material. So I became a producer and director for uh, six years. And while I was there, I delivered over 9,000 television shows. I did three a day with Jim and Now these were all, this is the beginning of access, right? This is the beginning of, let's have the community come in and talk. Let's have the musicians come in and play. Let's have the elephants arrive and perform. Let's have the Peking Circus perform. Uh, I did a show that uh, was called, that Dean Petty actually was hosting. And on Mondays, I had a lawyer. On Tuesdays, I had a doctor. On Wednesday, I had a stockbroker. Uh, stock and the people would phone in and say, I don't know if I need to go to the doctor. And the doctor would say, no, you don't. Right. And so uh, the Department of Health called and said, get that off the air. Uh, the uh, association in charge of the stockbrokers called and said, you can't promote stock. Stock market, and I had um, you and your lawyer with Rosie and Bella, who is now one of our best judges, and she was giving legal advice, you know, carefully. These were all professionals, but in fact, they were saying, you know, oh, what that lawyer told you, you know, I would just try, try to do it. And Rosie came to me one day and said, you know, I'm being considered for the Supreme Court. <laughs> the show. <laughs> right. So City reveled in the revolution. We had big movies that night, which, uh, does anybody know about the big movies? The big blue movies? No, it was so great. <laughs> well, we had to attract an audience. We thought, you know, how are we going to do that? Because this community access is not going to work. So we read movies. Uh, that had very soft sex, and we, we ran them at 12 midnight on Friday. And uh, the woman who started the challenge, Phyllis Switzer, used to have to sit and look at all these to make sure there wasn't any fun. We were here in the corner, and we would we hear her in her office listening to oh, oh, oh. <laughs> We would knock on the door going, You are right, or were you? Oh, but we have to get the editor in here and take this out. And stuff. So it was very soft stuff. But the traffic pattern actually changed because people were coming from Detroit, going into the Royal York Hotel for Friday night. Right? The hotels were filling up, people were wanting to watch. This little channel, you have to understand that City TV was a UHF channel. It wasn't even, it was on the dial, but never used. And a guy in Hall Street Spitzer figured out how to use it. And, and we went on the air with an antenna up on Eglinton. And sometimes I'm in the middle of directing a show and sometimes my TP would tap me on the shoulder and say, stop, stop, the antenna fell down. <laughs> There's no broadcast. <laughs> so over those six years, uh, we were raided by the police several times. Uh, we put programs on and them off, but we were making difference. We were uh, making a hold. The other broadcasters were looking at us concerned, but aware that we were breaking ground that they themselves. And CNN had, you know, would have been the logical extension of where City was going. But we got brought up by such a good. So, um, 
at that, you know, at that time, the broadcast environment, you have to understand, was very well set. The regulatory body, the CRTC, she used to control the highways. When stuff went through the air, we started controlling the highways. <laughs> and they were deciding, you know, who got a television station. And the process was really complicated, um, expensive, and only a few people could get through it. But in fairness, they always had their hearings open to the public. Well, one day, when I was sitting on the chairman of the CRTC, I said to him, you know, I just don't understand it. Uh, when I look at where you advertise that it's open to the public, it's in the classifieds, in a little strip in the classifieds. Why do you do that? He said, because we don't want them to come out. <laughs>
So it made a huge impression. And all of this that I'm talking about is kind of the highway that led to what we have now. So this was, you know, another step. Uh, we, we stopped being broadcast executives, or I stopped being broadcast executive, and started to be an orchestra. We don't like that program, we'll just rip that right off in <laughs> just a minute. <laughs> and that, that fed the hunger to, to get more and more. So um, it also introduced the concept of more. When PTV came into being, conventional television announced that this was the end of the, it was the end of CTV, it was the end of CBC, it was the end of global. Like they were hysterical. How uh, could the CRTC license this into their monopoly field? But what they didn't understand, and what's so prevalent today, is that people wanted more. They weren't going to get rid of the conventional. They were going to keep watching. They were going to have to pay. And the CRTC licensed specialty channels, history channel. Like, they were going to do that too. It was the philosophy of doing more, 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 which of course we're living today. So, um, so we got to this point, uh, the late 1990s, traffic on the internet grew by 100%. Cell phones came in in 1995, so you think it's always been you think it's always been there? No, you know it is. But it's not that long ago that this revolution happened. Um, Al Jazeera's came online. Does everybody know Al Jazeera's? Mm -hmm. Yeah, incredible change. They introduced the most incredible change into television and how it was made. Um, I don't know if you know, but they existed in the Arab world for 15 years before they came up in Washington five years ago and came into Canada. And in those 15 years in the Arab states, they were bombed, <laughs> they were locked out. The Arab states, with their government forms of dictatorship, did not want the people to be suddenly given cell phones and allowed to report the news. So, so they had a long history of remaining as neutral as they could and giving the people the means to see their own life portrayed on Al Jazeera's. And when they started in Washington and in Canada, the CRTC uh, would not give them a license the first time they applied here. And then subsequently did. But I have a good friend who's an executive with Al Jazeera's. And he works in Washington. He's Canadian. His wife teaches at one of the Canadian colleges here. And he says every time he goes into the States with his passport, where it's stamped that he is an executive for Al Jazeera's, he is searched, stopped, and questioned. So there is an image about Al Jazeera's that it is Doha-inspired, uh, Arab-inspired, which of course means terrorism and yada yada yada. It is not. It was really started by mostly uh, disgruntled people from the CBC who did the English version uh, five to six years ago. The BBC, when they shut down controversial programming, everybody congregated in Doha and <laughs> began to program to the world. So um, I support them 100%. You can stream them online. Uh, they still continue to be incredibly brave. I mean, they are the only ones that have, uh, that are using cell phone journalism uh, almost, you know, to a huge extent and sending their people behind enemy lines. I mean, they are brave. They are busy. And they do try. There's no interference from the uh, 
for the owners of college series. Now, some people don't believe that, but the people I know who work for Al Jazeera, who are all from Canada, uh, say that it isn't, and I'm uh, providing programs in Al Jazeera, so that was never in my uh, So, it's kind of a little, a little thing that now can say. But anyway, now we are in where we are, where the networks are streaming, everything is on the internet. Uh, uh, the networks are very, very scared still. Um, the producers are using crowd financing. Is everyone dealing with crowd financing? You know, where you go? Well, I'll give you an example. I had an intern. His name is Marwala uh, from India. Very wonderful intern, and he wanted to do he wanted to do a show on the security certificates that the Canadian government issues. Now, security certificates are just uh, a name for an ability to hold suspected terrorists uh, indefinitely uh, without any charges. So I was reading the paper one day and I heard about a young girl who had one intelligence set in her school. And uh, the school gave her the intelligence set and CSIS, who had driven her to school, which is pretty curious why CSIS is driving her to school, took the television away because this was a household in Trump that was not allowed to have any means of communication because they were suspected terrorists. Now, I said to her, really? <laughs> you want to do this? I said, okay, I'll, let's go out. And he was friends with five. He knew, he wasn't friends with them, but he researched them out. And he found five families who had all been held. Uh, the men had been held. Uh, the women, some were Canadian, some were not. And the families were mixed from different countries. But the five went together and spent 30 years in jail without so much as parking ticket. Never a job. It was, this is Canada. You would have seen this documentary very soon. And so off we went to the film board and, uh, oh, they were really interested. They knew about security certificates and people, we all know about this. We all know about what goes on. We just don't see it. And I'm not saying, you know, that, uh, you know, I spend my time um, fighting the government. I don't. I spend my time trying to give voices to people who don't have them. So, you know, these five men didn't have them. They had lawyers appointed for them by the government. Uh, and one of those lawyers is a good friend of mine. And the interesting thing is he was never allowed to tell his uh, plaintiff what any of the charges were. They may have told him some charges, but he is never, until he dies, and even when he dies, or even after he dies, allowed to disclose what any of those charges So this documentary called The Secret Child of Pie, uh, we went around and everyone was obviously totally interested, offered to hire a murder, said he thought he was the most talented young filmmaker that they had ever seen, but they weren't going to do this documentary. <laughs> so we only went to the people. And crowd financing is simply going along, telling people what you want to do, and showing them how you're going to do it and who these people are. And they send them money from everywhere. It's global. So Amar got all the shooting money in a year. It took a year. Because you have to do a lot of work. And crowd financing is a whole session and I'd be happy to come and talk about. But it is the new way in which um, independent producers, myself included, are financing our projects. So we're, you know, I still do go to <coughs> to Telefilm and LNDC and all of the structures that give up money, but basically I rely on people. So the Secret Trial 5, once it got shot, um, hot dogs 
gave me some money. And then just the other day, I turned on CTV's morning show, and there was a car saying, <laughs> and, and there was the morning show saying, how can this thing be happening again? <laughs> So, um, so that's a freedom for creative people, a place to go. Um, it makes the networks nervous, but there's now networks that all of this material can go on that are coming from the internet. Um, I know a broadcaster will take this on and run it when I mean, you're actually starting to bid on it because it's been done in a way that they can handle it, which is the right way. It's been done objectively, and it's not being done by cause by a radical group of people who have a cause. It's being done by their genius. Anyway, um, you know, since 2005, everything has grown. YouTube who made Justin Bieber. I mean, the networks always thought they made talent. Right. They would say, uh, again, much, we did much music at and so we started much music. And much music uh, was just coming on while I was leaving. Uh, my friends were doing it, and they were saying, you know, we're going to put this band on and that band on, and, you know, conventional television was saying, you can't put that band on. And, again, it, City TV didn't have that much money, so those were the bands. And uh, now YouTube, you know, makes Justin Bieber's career uh, for the game. Uh, you know, so that Korean pop star, he's made by uh, YouTube. So the whole line market is here. And uh, I will show my, my daughter who's involved in it was working on something for the um, Mobile Phone Association last night. And I was in my room going crazy with this. And uh, it was around 2 o'clock in the morning. I said, I'm going to bed yet. And she said, no, I've got a problem with this website. And I'm going to work on it. And I'm going to bed. And I'm like, no, because I'm. I'm watching Ustream. Do you have you experienced Ustream? Yes. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty amazing. That it is amazing, and Ustream, you know, is a cool new webcam from Logitech, uh, which can talk directly to your Wi-Fi hub by passing the computer, and so you can shoot the picture, encode the video, and send it directly. And my daughter said to me, uh, you've got to see this nomad couple who live in a trailer <laughs> and they teach you how to connect to uh, whatever problems you've got. They're teaching you how to connect to electronic things and, and do whatever. And they just use stream up whenever and move right along. They don't have, they have technology in their mobile home. But I don't know that they have computers necessarily. So, like, I mean, phenomenal. And it's, this is like here. What are you using it for? Oh, I remember used it to drive us and I watched a lot of events using it. Yeah. That's when I was, I, hadn't, I wasn't familiar with it until last night, which took me from 3 to 4 a.m. That was really fun. But the thing is that they're all, they didn't describe themselves as broadcasting. So you, can, you broadcast on this channel, you broadcast on that channel. And so you can be a broadcaster, you can be a Really. So that's what I call freedom. And uh, I don't know how many of you have time. Right. Thank you for listening. Uh, well, I want to, you know, I want to get some. Yeah. yeah. Um, so why go through this long litany of history and explosions and all of that? Um, I think it's good to know, it's always good to know where it came from and what was fought for and what's been given to you. 
I mean, just as a philosophy of love. Uh, the world is now much, it has another side to it. The world is much more now your responsibility than it ever was in my, in my age. I mean, if the broadcaster didn't tell me, I didn't know her. And now, you can look at Syria on YouTube and you can see what's happening. Or you can look anywhere else and see what's happening. I want to do a show. Um, well, I went to a, a thing the other day, which was uh, the Global Hunger uh, Group, uh, where a lot of feeding the hungry organizations have come up with a marketing uh, technique, which I a marketing tool, which I think is really fantastic, which is that they want us all to live for a dollar seventy five a day for a week. So we can get a sense of what it's like. So I was at the Nella Food Cucina where there was a chef with a big hat on and all the media were sitting at these tables and I was sitting at that table with someone who had talked to me. And he made three dishes for a dollar seventy-five. So afterwards we were talking and I said, you know, you've got to put this on television when they do it for a week. Uh, you're not allowed to cheat. You know, that's all you've got. You can bring friends over and you can grow your 175 by having five people go through it with you. <coughs> but you can't, you know, have a coffee because that would eat up most of all of it. Um, or you can't do any of the things that you would be doing. And I thought, you know, here's a channel. Here's a channel where you put people in solitary confinement. I mean, when I, when I say to Ruben Murray King Carter, you know, tell me again what was it like, what was it like being in Trenton prison, the oldest prison in the United States, in a hole in the floor. And he said, go in your bathroom. How big is your bathroom? So it's not, it's not that big. It's like, no, it's too big. Go in to find your bathroom that's this big. Shut the door and stay in there for 10 days. Now imagine <laughs> if you could just have that experience online or have that experience through the social media. It's not that you're doing it by just bringing the experience, like getting these people to eat for a dollar seventy-five a day. I mean, you might ask, is that really going to teach them about poverty? Yeah. It might teach them. It's certainly going to do more than doing nothing. And if they get hungry, they might know what hunger might hunger. So all this new technology of ours does bring the responsibility because once you know what hunger is, what are you going to do about it? You know, what are you going to do about it? the wrong infected sitting in jail? You know, is it really? <laughs> but it is, it is, and I, and we have to really um, give back. That the smaller the world gets, the closer we get to each other, the more we owe each other. You know, it's just beginning. That's where I see things working. They found that out by talking to them online. 
So they built a little place for him to come to. And in it was all, all, all carpentry things, building tools, all of these things. And they closed the exit off so we couldn't run away. And they had someone to make sure that he was okay. And what they found was that he built. He was happy all day. He wasn't agitated. He wasn't. I had two parents with all the time, so it's a good thing. Um, he didn't get upset. And the couple could bring him there in the morning and give him a good night. And it was an energizer. So they're very excited about this because they're not making money for the rest of all the time itself, so they better find a different way to deal with it. But that social media can, can bring that to their attention. And again, it's the same thing we can well, I wouldn't talk about um, so You know, about it's a voice that someone listened to. And medicine, and I think you know all the other things that it's changing, all of the unbelievably good things that they're doing. The doctors are walking around with your charts now. And, you know, I have two doctors in my family, and they're both grumbling about how to learn all this technology. But if someone has a heart attack in front of you, you've got a chart. And, you know, that's incredible. That's incredible. So it's a blissful age, and uh, I'd like to hear from you what you're doing what you're doing with it, what you want to do with it, and how myself or anybody in the media that I know would be of any help to you. Because I should tell you that most of us out there really want young people to come and be part of what's going on. Because you hold the keys to the technology. And Mitchell Broadcasting wants, they want streaming, they want social media, they want it more than they want programming, so they want you. So please, I'm done. You've got to talk to me.